CodeKit can help you identify syntax errors in both JavaScript and CoffeeScript files. Here, I have a JavaScript file selected, and if I'd like CodeKit to check it for errors, all I need to do is come over to the inspector pane and under Check Syntax With, choose a tool. There's three available, ESLint, JSHint, and JSLint. If you're wondering which one to use, your best bet is probably ESLint. It's almost infinitely customizable, and it supports future additions to the JavaScript language, ECMA Script 2015 and beyond. I'll choose ESLint for now. Let's go take a look at that main JS file. Well, the code doesn't look too awful, and there's nothing that jumps out immediately as a syntax error, so let's see what we get when I hit Command S. In the background, CodeKit says, okay, this file minified successfully, but ESLint found six issues. Now, like all entries in CodeKit's log, this one is collapsible, so we can hide it if we'd like. Over here in the black rectangle is the line number where the problem is, and the line of text or code appears right next to it. The column where the problem starts is highlighted in red. And then the error message that ESLint returns appears below. Here it's saying that B is assigned a value, but it's never used. And at the end of the line in gray is the name of the ESLint rule that produced this warning. If we want to turn off this warning or customize how it displays, this is the setting we'll need to look for in ESLint's configuration. Speaking of which, let's hop into project settings where ESLint is already the active category. Here's where we control how the syntax checker works. The top option tells it which version of JavaScript to target. The newest one is the default. Below that is a source type option. If you're writing a website, you're gonna use script. Module is more for application development. The next thing in the list is a text field where we can specify globals. Globals are simply variables that are defined somewhere outside of this file. Maybe in a script that we're importing in our head element on the page before we import main.js here. We don't want ESLint to tell us, hey, variable so-and-so is undefined, so we just add that variable's name to our text field here, and then ESLint knows that that variable is declared elsewhere. If we're working in certain environments, we can check those right here, and the associated globals will be added to our list automatically without us having to type them all in. For example, jQuery is checked, so every global associated with jQuery is automatically added to our list, and ESLint won't warn us about them being undefined. The next setting is really important. If you work in a team and some of your team members don't use CodeKit, it's very likely that they configure ESLint using a special settings file named .eslintrc. If you'd like, you can have CodeKit adopt that file rather than use the settings from the UI. To do that, simply select here, use .eslintrc settings only. The default is merge, and in this case, if a setting is specified in both the file and CodeKit's UI, the one in CodeKit's UI wins. Below that, we start to get into the actual rules that make up ESLint itself. Each rule is either on or off, and we set that simply by checking or unchecking the rules that we want ESLint to run. A short description appears below the rule's name, but what you'll really want to do is open the help page by clicking this button right here. That'll open ESLint's official documentation for this rule in a little popover. The documentation is excellent. It gives you a thorough walkthrough of why you might want to use the rule, what's considered error cases, what's considered passing cases, and more details than you could ever want to know about the JavaScript language. This is really fantastic documentation. Some rules have option parameters. The option parameter can be a variety of things. In some cases, it's just a simple string, like here. This one is just never. We don't ever want to allow comma dangles. Some option parameters get more complicated. They're actual JavaScript objects, like here, where this is a key value pair, allow, and it takes an array, warn, and error. The option parameters are very clearly defined in each rule's documentation when they apply. Before you change an option parameter, you should read these examples thoroughly so that you don't make any typos or pass incorrect parameters to the option. If that happens, ESLint will not run correctly, and you'll receive an error in CodeKit's log. CodeKit allows you to combine multiple JavaScript files together. There's a whole other screencast with details. Here in main.js, I'm now prepending jQuery.javascript. And in the app, I've also changed main.js to check syntax with JS hint instead of ESLint. Let's see what happens when I run a check syntax on this file. 
Well, it worked. JS Hint tells me it checked jQuery and main.js together, but look at this. I've got 122 issues in jQuery, and jQuery is not my code. It's not like I'm going to go and modify jQuery. So I don't really want to see these issues. I can just collapse that row and look at only the three issues that JS Hint found in main.js. But what if I just want CodeKit to ignore jQuery by default? I don't want to have to collapse this row every time I check syntax in my file. Well, that's easy to do. I'll just come back to the files list, select main.js, and go into the linked files pane. Here, there's a shield checkbox. If I uncheck it, what that means is that when this chain of files is syntax checked, CodeKit will ignore any issues in unchecked files here. So now, I'll come back and recheck the syntax in main.js. And I'll see, sure enough, CodeKit says there's three syntax issues, which are only the ones in my file. Now, of course, jQuery is still checked in the chain because elements in this file might affect what happens in main.js. They're linked. But those issues are collapsed by default, and they will not cause the app to beep or come to the front if there were no issues in my own file, main.js.